Okay, we're going to go on to suspension. Uh, what's the big deal with Christie's suspension? It's a big, it's a big spring on, on an arm. The, the, the main attraction of it is that um, Christie's big thing was he wanted very, very fast tanks. Um, if you go back and look at the publicity he came out with, he was, he was treating his, his tank as essentially a race car. He wanted to get it up about 40, 40, 45 miles an hour, perhaps even more. And of course, on the Christie tank, you could take the track off, and that's what really sped it up, because if you're driving on the wheels on a hard road, you could really go like hell. So uh, as soon as other solutions are available, um, they're, they're taken up. Actually, the T-34 was supposed to have its Christie suspension replaced in 1941. Even the, uh, even the Red Army realized its limitations, the amount of volume it took up in the hull. And there was a 1941 program called uh, T-34M where they were going to replace the uh, Christie-style spring suspension with torsion bar. And, um, but the war intervened, and rather than upset the production line, they stayed with Christie suspension right to the end of the war. But the next generation tank, the, the T-44, got torsion bar. But the torsion bar was so popular with the Germans, right? Yeah, well, it, it was just a decision that they made that the uh, spring in under the floor, that they left the most useful volume in the tank above where, and where it was useful in the fighting compartment. That was the primary design idea of it. But then again, Krupp were always using the uh, leaf springs, and every time they got involved in tank design, they wanted to bring back the leaf spring. Now, of course, the British, the, you had your independent suspension for a while, but then you went to the bogies. You went to Centurion Chieftain. What do you guys know that the rest of the world doesn't, that you're still using bogey suspension? Um, firstly, we're not. Um, we have progressed and caught up with the rest of the world. Um, <laughs> what we discovered was Christie's suspension was brilliant, but you reach a stage where the weight exceeds the mass that the spring can cope with. You could put a spring in there and you're getting ridiculous sizes. So uh, another system was um, required. And we came up with what was known as the horseman. And basically it's two axles like that with a center spring, or in actual fact, it's three springs coiled inside each other. And if the ground pushes up like that, that axle will move, or that one. And it works fairly well. The problem is when you have a bump that causes them both to go up, you lose a lot of the shock absorption on it. Advantages of it, you hit a mine, it blows, you unbolt it, fit a new one on. That's a very simplistic view of it, but that was one of the advantages why we went for it. We also looked at torsion bars and we decided that this, for a battle tank, a torsion bar is going to create, as we said there, height volume problems and we didn't want it. Also, the damage from a mine on a torsion bar is horrendous to strip a bar out and replace it. It takes up far more time. We stuck with horsemen through Centurion, Conqueror, Chieftain, and then when we moved on to Challenger 1 and Challenger 2, we went to individual hydrodynamic units, which is what we're running with today. Um, the only variations there, Chieftain did try a thing called a hydro strut, which where they took the normal suspension off and put a hydromatic unit in, and it did make a lot of difference, but that was purely a trial. Conqueror had eight units instead of... Um, or four aside instead of three for Centurion. And the only other difference it had, instead of having the tire outside the wheel, the wheels were resilient and the tire was inside, bonded in, which when Conquer was going flat out through a cobbled road in Germany, gave it that most fantastic roaring, droning noise and shook the houses beyond belief and the Germans hated it. <laughs> no, I think Kenny's missing out though, never having had the joy of changing a torsion bar. Uh, yes. 432? That sums it up. Yeah. Um, torsion bars, if you have everything going right for you, you can unbolt everything, the axle arm, and you should be able to pull it out, and it'll slip in and get the new one. That happens when you build the vehicle. From there on, it gets distorted, it gets dirt, it gets bonded inside, and it takes an awful lot to knock it out. We have got torsion bars, but we've kept it with our combat vehicle reconnaissance series, such as the Scorpion you'll see in the museum and the rest of the family. They use torsion bars. Um, FV-432 uses it, all to good effect, but they're lighter vehicles. These, this particular one, the, the rebuilt ones, probably work the best. These are the best seven Conquerors built, the rebuilt Canadi because they had everything that had gone wrong on the others. All the latest designs were put into these and they solved most of the problems. So this was one of the better ones. 
Okay, we are going to go on then. Uh, a question, not actually specified who it was. The question is, how did man hour construction time vary between uh, the Germans and the Russians? I mean, okay, the Russians were piling them out. Was it just because they had more factories or because they were more efficient using man hours? I, I would probably argue, if you're talking the T-34, I'd probably argue that the T-34 is a, a simpler design. I mean, if you actually physically look at a T-34 compared to, say, a Panzer III or a Panzer IV, it has far, far fewer parts. I think that there was a very conscious decision on the part of the Russian designers to minimize the number of man hours that had to go into the construction of a T-34. One thing you have to keep in mind, the, the Russian m military technology philosophy is that a tank isn't going to last very long. And so there's no point spending a lot of money and a lot of time on quality. That certainly goes against the German engineering tradition. Um, and I think as a result, you'll find that the T-34, I don't know any, I've never seen anyone sit down and actually do a calculation of either man hours or cost, um, comparative cost. I mean, I have a cost. I know what the Russian cost was on a T-34. I could probably find what the man hours were, but I, I'm not quite certain that that's comparable, but I think that you would find that the, the Russian figure is significantly lower than the German, and, and deliberately so. Yeah, I think that the Germans just wanted to build uh, a much higher quality vehicle, but they hadn't taken into account that they wouldn't last that long. Um, and the, it has to be remembered that we're, there was not the sort of production lines that we think of today in car manufacturing or whatever. Uh, these vehicles were individually constructed, basically, and that's very clear when you look at the uh, vehicles like Panther and Tiger. The, um, each individual hull could be up to 25 millimeters uh, an inch uh, difference in width and so forth, and that was coped with by the assembly firms. Uh, when they were making the final assembly and if something didn't fit they cut a bit off or they ground it down or they uh, uh, welded a bit on to make it fit uh, so by that stage they were getting much less careful but in the earlier vehicles if you look at Panzer IV you see an awful lot of beveling on plates and so forth and you think well why on earth would you bother you know it would have been just as good rough Okay, uh, this is going to be a short question, but it is asked, uh, are there any data for comparative trials of guns of all countries made in one place under the same criteria allowing a direct comparison between them? No. 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 There is our short answer. No, no the, Ger the Germans tested their guns against German targets, and uh, I presume everybody else did exactly the same. So they were all looking at different uh, sets of criteria. That was one accomplishment of NATO, was this NATO standard target, however, okay. that the British, Germans, and Americans all practice against. Uh, That's now, though. Okay, uh, we, we kind of touched upon uh, the American use of British uh, weapons with the Firefly question, but uh, more specifically about SABO, uh, APDS rounds. Uh, why did the U.S. take so long to actually put it into service? I mean, the British were churning them out in the 40s. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's a misnomer there. Again, it's a, how soon is it recognized as a good idea, and then what's the engineering, and then how many, when is it, are you comfortable with going ahead and producing a lot of these? Generally, I think American tank design tends to be conservative. Part of the reason is that we are going to produce them in the thousands in the case of ammunition in the tens, hundreds of thousands. So you have to be fairly certain it's going to be functional. Um, the Americans go to high velocity armor piercing, HVAP, in uh, 1944. And that seems to solve most of the immediate problems. American research in discarding Sabo ammunition is continuous from 1945 onwards. Generally, what I found in just looking at the M103 tank, which did have a discarding Sabo round and an HVAP round engineered, but never put into production for its 120 millimeter gun, generally the Americans found disappointing results with dispersion of the discarding Sabo round, so that it was not considered reliable. The H and the HVAP rounds frequently uh, both the discarding Sabo and the HVAP rounds were found to be more prone to ricochet against sloped armor 
than the capped armor-piercing rounds, which were vintage 1943 onward. So uh, they never, we never saw until we went to the 105 millimeter uh, British round, the L5, uh, we never s had any confidence that there were any decisive results to be achieved with those munitions, given the way we manufactured them and designed them in the 50s. Okay, well, we'll take that, so. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm going to push a button on this side. Uh, somebody put in a question about the Stug E100 crocodile design. Would it have ever worked? <laughs> I, I think it's going to be another short answer. <laughs> well, as far as I'm concerned, I've never seen any primary documentation saying such a thing existed other than in the adverts by model makers. Uh, so, I know nothing about it. Uh, the, the, that particular weapon was not designed by or for the Wehrmacht. It was designed by a modeler. <laughs> it, is, it is purely urban legend. <laughs> no, no, seriously, these, these days with the Internet, I mean, this probably wouldn't have happened so much in the old days, but there's a lot of very talented modelers these days who will take, you know, a mouse kit or an E100 kit or something and go and slab on a new superstructure, a new big monster gun, make a very attractive-looking thing and invent a name for it. And it goes up on the internet and swings around. In this particular case, it was a modeler who did it, and then a model company, I think it was Trumpeter, came out with a kit of it. Um, well, sorry, but uh, <coughs> Mr. Doyle and Mr. Jens were not the source in this particular case. It was the imagination of a, of a clever modeler. And, and then, then, it, then it gets lo locked into urban legend, and people think that it really exists. Yeah, I mean, obviously, there was lots of proposals coming from companies and designers and so forth for all sorts of weird and wonderful things, but I've never seen anything of that nature. Okay, uh, I, I, I say a, a question I handed up here just now. It's not, uh, no name was assigned to it, and he, he put two. He put one he decided he wasn't going to ask it, and then he put another one on the back. I think the one he decided not to ask was more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> So we were talking about naming tanks earlier, and, and the question is, uh, what, what person is most deserving to have a tank named after them but never got the honor? James Gavin. <laughs> <laughs> 113. And, uh, any, anybody who's on tank then will know I said that. I, no, I, you know, James Gavin was a great commander, but he doesn't really deserve an armored vehicle named after him. He was a paratrooper. <laughs> There, there's, a, there's a long backstory about it. If, you, if you're familiar with it, and the guy is actually on the, the World of Tanks forum as well, uh, you, you'll find it in the modern armor section. I, I could add one detail, though. P people don't realize that sometimes names are approved for vehicles and um, don't actually go into service. Um, one example being on the, uh, what eventually becomes called the uh, Bradley Fighting Vehicle. Originally, the Army planned and actually authorized two different names. The M2, the infantry vehicle, was going to get the name Bradley, as it eventually did. But the M3 cavalry vehicle was going to be named after Jacob Devers, who commanded the Arm U.S. Armored Force in 1942-43, uh, later went on to command uh, uh, the, the um, Army group uh, uh, that came up uh, through, through, uh, through the yeah, Sixth Army group that came up through the Med. Um, but in the end, the Army, for simplification, just kept it Bradley fighting vehicle. And the uh, M8, which was type classified but never actually produced, the armored gun system, which would have been produced down the road here in San Jose, that was uh, that was Buford, or it was named. Yeah, it was Buford. Yeah, yeah. But it never. Uh, in, the name was approved. The d it was type classified, but it never got produced. Of course, then you have the other example. Uh, Sergeant York, such a great soldier, got his name attached to that, uh, that wonderful DVAT system, yeah. uh, which was an utter failure. Um, uh, I had something here. Okay, uh, tank production. Uh, how much of a tank is built in one location? Uh, I mean, the Germans had the well, I mean, distributed the, system. Oh, uh, the Germans had a completely distributed system, and the companies that you hear about, like Krupp, uh, well, it's Krupp Groysenberg in Magdeburg, um, but you get these uh, companies, and they're the assembly company, companies. They're not the builders of the tank, because the armoured hulls are coming from uh, Dortmund Hoder Hutrin, from Krupp Essen, from Buhler in Austria, and so forth. So, and then all of the mechanical components, the motors are coming from Maybach in Friedrichshafen or Nordbau in Berlin, which is a part of Maybach. Um, so it's completely distributed, and e small components were being made in village uh, sheds. 
Well, at least the good thing was you couldn't actually bomb one factory and knock everything out. Well, that was, I told you about the uh, mouse being knocked out because it was all being done more or less in the one place. Okay, was there any serious study done to incorporate ergonomics or usability, crew comfort? <laughs> and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go right past the eight pounds of 38. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> there, 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 was, there was, after the war started, I think, far more so than at the beginning of the war. I think at the beginning of the war it wasn't really a concern, but you can see in U.S. tank design that there is a lot of interest, mostly because of complaints from the field. Um, the best example, actually, is hatches. Um, the main concern after um, initial combat by the U.S. Army was that the hatches on U.S. tanks were far too small. Uh, they were bad enough when crews were just wearing light coveralls, but in winter months when they had more layers of clothing, it became impossible to get out um, after the tank was combat damaged. So you can see in the second generation Shermans, the so-called wet hull Shermans, that they go from the small hatches to the large hatches. Yeah, and you can, see, you can see it also up on the top of the turrets. Light tanks from M3 to M5. Yeah, M M5, if you look at the, the turret hatches on the M5A1 out here, it's quite, quite spacious considering how small the turret is, but the M3 is a horror. <laughs> if you ever tried to get into an M3 turret, the, the hatches are very, very tiny. Uh, Sergeant Grunt, where are you? Sergeant Grunt has left the building. No, there you are. What you got? Uh, well, I know what you got, but announce it for the... <laughs> the okay, question was, how common is APCR ammo and who used it? By percentage. <laughs> By percentage? <laughs> 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 I, I certainly don't. But have we, do, we do not. We I, do I, not have this numbers available to us. We will have to get back to you. Next <laughs> year. <laughs> because it's an issue through time. I, I mean, our, our armies at one point in the war will be using X percentage of particular mixes of ammunition. But you know, the thing to keep in mind, and may, maybe this is a good, 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 good time to get on a rant. Um, uh, all, all, you, all you guys who play uh, World of Tanks are primarily thinking about fighting other tanks. But when, um, when you come down to it in tank combat, and I mean tank combat in the more general sense, tank versus tank combat is not very common. And so most, most tanks which go out into the field have very little AP ammunition on board. Um, if you go through, there was an extensive debate in the U.S. Army on this whole issue. You know, what is the proper mix? You know, how much smoke do you carry? How much HE do you carry? How much armor piercing do you carry? And invariably, the answer comes out that the, uh, the predominant load on U.S. tanks is HE, um, then a percentage of smoke and a percentage of AP, because the number of times that a U.S. tank encounters an enemy tank in the ETO, and certainly even more so in the Pacific, very, very small. I mean, it's, it's, it's rare. There are occasions, of course, where it becomes the dominant form of combat. The, um, uh, there are certain points in time, for example, the Ardennes. But other times, you know, take U.S. tank units in Normandy. How often do they encounter tanks? They encounter them in little spurts. You know, when the Germans launched the, uh, the attack near Le Désert in the middle of um, July, there's suddenly a bunch of Panthers that show up. And then it's calm, and you know, they uh, run into the occasional tank here and there. Then during Operation Cobra, when they make out the breakout against Panzer Lehr Division, they suddenly encounter a fair number of tanks. But then they go for weeks, if not months, hardly ever. You know, they'll encounter an occasional Stug III, um, that sort of thing. But um, not a lot of tank combat. I mean, I've seen Army documents where they say in August 1944, we're not going to see any more German tanks. We don't have to worry about the 17-pounder business, HVAP, any of that sort of stuff. And then Operation Queen in November up near Aachen, suddenly the Germans throw in some armor. Then there's a lot of concern about German tanks. Then a month goes by, and then, of course, the bulge. Bulge, a lot of tank fighting, but after the bulge, no. I mean, the, the German tank strength on the Western Front after the bulge is, there, there's hardly anything, and most of it is uh, Panzerjägers and uh, Stugs, very, very few tanks. So um, the mixture varies with time because of the target, but the point I'd like to emphasize most of all is that the, the primary use of the tank is to fire HE against um, other sort of targets other than tanks. So it's easy to get preoccupied with um, the, the armor piercing issue, but the, the tankers in the field or uh, were primarily concerned about HE. In fact, it's, it's the reason that the U.S. Army resisted getting the 76-millimeter gun on the Sherman so long. The 76-millimeter um, the gun on the Sherman had a much smaller HE round, or a much smaller high-explosive fill in the round than did the um, 75. A lot of units preferred sticking with the 75-millimeter gun. It didn't have as good an, an AP performance as did the 75, 
but day in, day out, they were firing HE and they wanted good HE. In fact, the, the, the main suggestion in 1945, there's a new weapons board that goes around in Europe in uh, the later part of 1944. The primary idea is that the majority of tanks in the U.S. Army should be M4 105mm howitzers and that, that a smaller fraction should be M26s. M26 will take care of the tank fighting, but they want something that really fires HE. They also had the M45, wasn't it? It was the, the yes. brushing with the 105? Yeah, but the issue there is, is that you you're going to end up with a limited number of the new M26 series, and you can stick that same 105 in Shermans, and you've got, a, you know, you can crank out Shermans Point. in the bajillions. We're talking medium tanks here, too. Uh, <clears throat> in the Pacific, the light tanks had a good long lifespan because they could fire canister. And on Saipan, the light tanks wound up carrying about 50% HE and 50% canister because that's what they were expending. Okay, armor design is described as the holy trinity of armor, firepower, mobility. Uh, should we be focusing only on those three or is there another category that probably should have equal weight? I vote communications because a tank is useless if it can't talk to other tanks, infantry, air. Now, not today with digitization, you can't even talk without it. Yeah. There's no way to uh, interrogate anything. Uh, would you consider the T-54 to be the first main battle tank? Uh, Centurion Panther. fans might argue that. Panther. No. Panther. Mm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I found a document, by the way, where the, uh, the American attempt to change the nomenclature of the M60, the main battle tank, was first refused by the administration controlling the federal supply calendar. Uh, uh, catalog, federal supply catalog. They were not interested in doing new typesetting. So it reverted. <laughs> I'm not making this up. Like, they, uh, it, so it reverted to tank, comma, combat, fully tracked, uh, 105 millimeters.